Thank you so much for such an illuminating, touching, and, and informative documentary. Um, I think you know it's easy for us to forget how groundbreaking this show really was. Um, so let's talk about that. Um, Marilyn, your film not only celebrates this iconic and important part of our American popular culture for the last 50 years, um, but it really helps us understand and contextualize it. And you have explored ballroom dancing in New York and, uh, and other documentaries involving performance and young people, and you worked on The Electric Company. What prompted you to take on this particular project? Uh, a story that I love to tell. Um, I, on occasion, direct sh short segments for Sesame Street, the current oh. incarnation of Sesame Street. And one of the first things I did for them was a music video with Ernie. And I was so excited. Once we wrapped, I posted a picture of Ernie and I on Facebook. And Trevor, who I've known for 25 years. Something like that, yeah. <laughs> um, had just optioned the book by Michael Davis, Street Gang, and was looking for a director. And he happened to be on Facebook. And there I was with Ernie. And it clicked. And lucky for me. And that was how it happened. Yeah, wow. Facebook is good for something. Yeah. It's good for finding directors. So I highly recommend it if you're looking for uh, directors to find. Yeah, we have to scrounge around to find what it is yeah. good for these days. <laughs> so um, how closely did you hew, or how much did you rely on Michael's book then? Uh, all of you, I guess, Trevor and Marilyn. And Helen. I'll, I'll just say that um, Michael's book certainly was the foundation, uh, and it told us so many things that we didn't know. Um, you know, Sesame Street is one of these things that you think you know so much about, but yet there was so much uh, about the origins of it that none of us knew. And um, once the interview process started and uh, we started talking to the people that were part of the original show, it just took a life of its own, the film version of it. and. Um, People were saying things like, oh, you must speak to this person or that person. And then yeah. a new story would open up and a new avenue. And um, it, it really became its own wealth of storytelling that was uh, amazing and seemingly bottomless. Yeah, we like to say, I mean, and Michael's book for us was really such a revelation. I mean, it is. Um, the complete history of Sesame Street for the first 40 years. <laughs> I mean, the show is about to start its 52nd season, so that's really kind of crazy when you think about it, right? But what when Trevor had read the book, he passed it on to me, and I, he, he said, I want to see what you think. And I was so surprised. We all grew up watching Sesame Street, and I was so surprised about what I didn't know. I was surprised by its roots, its intentionality, um, what it was doing from a social, uh, you know, a, a social political aspect of, of how to address inequity in our society. And I'm like, I, if I didn't know that, I, I figured a lot of people mm -hmm. didn't know that as well. And we thought that was a really inspiring place to frame our documentary from. Mm -hmm. You know, really this origin story and how important it was to tell. I mean, I'm like a Muppet super fan. Like, I grew up with the show and I have these really great memories of watching the show with my parents in our basement in Long Island, and we were laughing together. So, I, you know, when I picked up Street Gang, I was very sure that absolutely nothing new was going to really, like, come to light. But I was really blown away by just how much I didn't know. I mean, I didn't really know who Joan Gans Cooney was. I'd never heard of John Stone ever before, mm -hmm. and obviously I knew a lot about Jim Henson because he's Jim Henson, but that's one of the things I think is so funny. So many times when we would talk about the documentary or bring it up that we were doing this project, people say, oh yeah, the Jim Henson show. you know, And no one knew that it was not just an idea that he helped to create, but that there were so many people that were behind this uh, you know, just impressive gang of creative rebels that made this amazing thing that changed everything. Well, like you said, I didn't know who John Stone was either. I, I had heard of Joan Gans Cooney. I certainly knew who Jim Henson was. I, but I wondered if that was part of you know, your intent, was to kind of reestablish the importance, his, his place oh, yeah. in the whole pantheon. We had uh, many discussions at first. How do you tackle a story as vast as Sesame Street? It has been part of the culture for over 50 years. 
it is, uh, there's such a vast array of people behind it. And we decided to structure the film around three main characters, Joan Gans Cooney, Jim Henson, and John Stone. And John Stone even became the emotional core of the yeah. film because he is the unsung hero and uh, so much of it came from him. I mean, even the concept of this brownstone in a, in a city street, I mean, that had never been done before, anything like that. And so that started to take form for us. And also, we decided to limit the time frame to roughly the first 20 years of the show and uh, basically to sort of end it with the death of Jim Henson that seemed a, a milestone yeah. that, that could comfortably end this film and just leave it at the origin story about these activists, about these revolutionaries, really. I think we talked about that the most. It was like, when were we going to end mm -hmm. The film, because it's not something that has a definitive ending, because you still know going. it's still going. Yeah, yeah. So, and it's still doing so many different things. And if you saw our two and a half hour rough cut, you would understand how hard that was. <laughs> <laughs> it was closer I, to three, I think, <laughs> originally. I was going to ask you about that because I, I was figuring that there were probably things left on the cutting room floor that you, that were just Nothing. really hard to no. get so up. <laughs> nothing at all. It was we put in everything we wanted to, and there's nothing on the DVD that's left. But okay, so imagine that we are about to have the director's cut. What can you share with everybody here that you oh kind of wish you'd been able to get in there? Well, the stories of the puppeteers. Yeah. Um, there's two in particular. Um, Jerry Nelson. Jerry Nelson and Richard Hunt. Richard Hunt. Who yeah. Jerry Richard. Um, were so that we had stories about them. Um, fully fleshed out stories about who they were and what they l brought to the show. And, you know, as it, in every documentary film, so much has to go. Things that you are certain that will make it to the end because they're so precious and so amazing. And We're the only ones that have dealt with that, though. <laughs> every, nobody else has this issue. Um, so many stories. Yeah, and I think for me, you know, we touch a little bit on in the film, but we introduce you to Evelyn Davis, right, who was in, mm -hmm. we're the head of um, the community outreach and community organizing. And so when we look at it from today's lens, right, about this show that wanted to reach children of color and, sh and ensure that what they were creating was actually reaching the audience and was being impactful, they made sure to bring on Evelyn Davis, who was also the founder of 100 Black Women in New York City, and she created this network of outreach workers that went in and, I mean, her story alone is fascinating and so interesting, and shows what they were doing in 1968 was what we should all be doing now and what you're, we talk about now, but it was really, it was revolutionary at the time, and it was like such a, a critical, core component of how they put that show together. And just knowing and being able to tell more about it is something that, you know, was another direction that we were wanting to make sure that we, we gave enough um, weight to, but how do you pull that into the story overall? Yeah, I wondered about that. I mean, we talk about diversity now, of course, much more, and back then, the word probably wasn't even being used, right. but, uh, so they were way ahead of their time in that respect. Um, but I wondered how you balanced sort of there's the nostalgic factor, like we're all, you know, singing put down the ducky and, you know, there's <laughs> those moments. And then there's, you know, how it was all put together. And then there's just the moments like knowing, you know, what went on in Mississippi and, you know, the really important societal moments. How did you, you balanced it so well. How, how do you do that? I would imagine that would not be an easy balancing act. Really, I think for us, the guiding principles were to um, stick to the story of these characters, these three main characters mostly, but from there to tell the pertinent things that were uh, unknown. And of course, the clips from the show are delicious and they're, f they're fantastic to watch. And they are accessible to you can go on YouTube and see a lot of classic Sesame clips, but we wanted to really use the ones that were helping us tell the story of this little band of rebels. It was always about that. It was always about this little group who, they were activists, they were artists, they were, um, they were so badass in, in that time. <laughs> they were so daring. You know, I always, I always think that, you know, if you put one amazing thing if you're the pioneer of one element, 
you know, you'll have a good show or you'll have a movie, you'll have something that sort of continues and people talk about it. But there were so many firsts that happened with Sesame. Mm -hmm. it, it, it was almost like an embarrassing amount of things that came together. You know, the first interracial cast all living in the same street in the same building, you know, the first time that they had done community outreach, the first time that you paired, you know, really biting, uh, you know, improv comedy for kids, you know, it's just, there were so many of these things that again and again and again, they were the first on, the first time to put education and entertainment together. I mean, that's, it was all of it, you know, it was all of it together. And Joan has this great quote, which I'm absolutely butchering, but, um, you know, she said, every one of us was great individually, but together we were a genius. And I think that's such a great way to say it because you had all these amazing minds and each one would have been one thing, but then to have it all together, you know, that's the part that created this absolute magic. They were coming together for a purpose that was larger than themselves. Yeah. You know, how often in our world do people do that? How often right? in the entertainment industry? Yeah. And in the, right? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, when you look at, you know, and I think one of the other struggles we had with this film is the gang is large. You yeah. know, that's why we included in the credits is put down the ducky and you get to see how many people it actually took to put this show on. And we had to make very choiceful decisions around who from the gang we were gonna highlight to tell the story of that particular role. Um, but they were all of a common purpose. And that was that they wanted to do something valuable and important for children in our society. And that's so inspiring. You know, and it's a goal that not everyone subscribes to today. <laughs> well, well, how about the U.S. government giving them $8 million because they saw in front of them an idea that was going to change the equation? Yeah. And something that's the equivalent of $57 million today. Wow. I mean, imagine the, the U.S. government giving this group of creatives that kind of faith and that kind of uh, backing. I don't think if they had $57 million today, even now, I don't think you could produce 130 episodes a season. It's like an insane amount of television. I, yeah. It's so much. All original music, yeah, all original nuts. writing. Hour. Do, do you think, I was thinking about sort of the, you know, the, the purpose that was bigger than themselves and sort of the idealism involved. Do you think it was of its particular time? Because we, you know, this is the 60s. It was the late 60s. There had been so much, you know, people were, were protesting and doing things. Do you think that really influenced it as well? Oh, for sure. Yeah. I, it, it gave birth to it. Yeah. And, and I was thinking this past summer, you know, we were all isolated and all these things are happening. But I was looking at the, you know, Black Lives Matter, Me Too. We're, it's almost like our society is in a similar cycle now. And um, it, it made me feel so proud that we made this film because it, it, it seems the time for it somehow. Mm -hmm. yeah. we're, we're in another moment of reevaluating who we are, questioning what we stand for. And we need inspiration. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we are, we are, uh, there's a dearth of inspiration these days, you know, and positive stories about how we can make a difference, you know, and I think we need to hear these stories. There's a lot of negative out there, but we need to understand that people can come together from a lot of diverse backgrounds and make something that is really good. And that's yeah. an important story to tell. It doesn't talk down. It yeah. doesn't respect kids. It doesn't pander. And I think, you know, through a lot of our interviews and, and you know, learning about these amazing people, they didn't always get along. Right. You know, I mean, there wasn't, there, were, there weren't always moments, it didn't make it into the film, but, I, you know, I think it was either Chris or, or Nick who said, you know, they fought, but they fought like family fights. You know, well, maybe some people's family fights dirty. I don't, I don't think you know, anybody would anyway, want to see my family fights. That's not fights. this movie. That's a different <laughs> film. Don't, you know. But, it, you know, they all, as Chris says at the end of the movie, they, you know, they loved each other. Yeah. You know, and, and so, yeah, there were, there were things that people felt were important that they wanted to have go a specific way. But in the end, you know, they all knew why they were there. And it was something that was, uh, you know, so important. And when you, when you, have a thing that is so important, somewhere in the back of your mind, you know that it's 
the, the making of it, the coming together of all these people, of all these minds, that's the part that's the most important thing, beyond all the sort of petty, you know, small creative differences or whatever, but this was a group of people that really got it. The goal is bigger than anything, yeah. everything else. I really am moved by the, and I always loved this part of the film that talks about how they, um, you know, at the cost of their own children and their own families, they stayed working till four in the morning. You know, Jim Henson didn't go home for four days in a row, this kind of thing, because they threw themselves 100% at this experiment. That's what it was, it was an experiment. It was completely throwing something against the wall to see if it would stick. And they gave themselves to it. 100%. And there's a personal toll for that. And I think that was an important part that right, right. when you're giving yourself up to something bigger that you do have, yeah. you know, you're giving up something in that, right? And and that was also, you know, people like to, we have delicious Muppet outtake moments in the film, right? And people, we love seeing these, but the, there's a purpose for these outtakes. It's because we're showing real people at work. This is about, this film's about the gang and these people that have come together and they didn't go home. They worked for multiple days. They had, you know, they had moments on set. Sometimes they, you know, they, you know, they, they made mistakes and we wanted to show that because again, it's going back to this humanity of this group of people that created this extraordinary thing and continue to create this extraordinary thing. And when you talk about the humanity, I was thinking, and, and also the experimental aspect, the idea of when uh, Will Lee died, Mr. Hooper died, mm -hmm. and they just thought, let's use this as like a teachable moment. Let's actually right. do something with this. That seems like something, obviously that talking about death might not have been planned, but they took that opportunity and seized on it and did something really beautiful with it. Um, I, yeah. The one thing that's extraordinary is that um, Although Sesame Street was on public television and not network television, the networks did recognize what Sesame Street was bringing into the culture and the value of it. And that um, Goodbye Mr. Hooper episode aired on Thanksgiving. And that decision was made because the producers understood that families would be together. And it was a great moment to have this big lesson and this, this very important episode. And that um, episode was promoted on network television. So the networks that weren't even airing Sesame Street um, promote it. This is uh, such, uh, it's just something that doesn't happen today. Yeah. Another groundbreaking breaking yeah. moment. And even in the beginning of the show, you know, it was on network television, the very first few episodes, just to, because everybody knew how important it was. And it's something that you, you, we probably won't ever see again like that in that way. I also appreciate the film doesn't shy away from, you know, the sight of earnest white people worrying about these education gaps and, and also not think, you know, the fact that they had some structural racism going on themselves in the writer's room, and you, you show that. Um, did that come up when you spoke with anyone? Was that, were, those, were those discussions ever had? Or There were a few things in the film that I think um, perhaps uh, the people that were interviewed and perhaps the people at the Sesame Workshop today weren't, wouldn't have chosen to talk about. But I think overall, um, in the context of it was really experimental. So there was a learning curve. And um, if we're gonna make a film that goes a little bit under the surface, let's talk about that a little mm -hmm. bit. Mm -hmm. And um, we yeah. wanted to not, we didn't want to make a film that was a love poem. It, it's, it is a love poem, but we wanted to also show the- Warts and all. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And I think, I, again, a testament to the show and why it endures is that they never shy away from these difficult conversations. Right. Right, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it's, did, did they always get it right? No. Were there mistakes? Yes. You know, when you there was a whole section we considered just showing the letters that came into the show. We we kind of touched on that a little bit in the Roosevelt Franklin piece, but there's so many, uh -huh. you know, and Sonia talks about these act, having meetings with activist groups. There's so much input that people gave because we all, and I think that's also the beauty of it. We all have a shared ownership in the show. It is woven into the fabric of our lives, and the people who make that show. They feel that, and they respond to it, and they don't shy away from it. And just like all of us, it, you, you make mistakes, but they continue to look for ways to 
to learn from it and to have us learn from it, which I think is, you know, what we've taken away. And also, I think we just we, you know, we all made a very conscious decision to have the story told from the voices of of those people. So we we found this amazing treasure trove of footage in in all of our 16 millimeter footage that we found, which was almost 11 hours of footage um, of that was shot by Victor DiNapoli, who was an art director um, at the time in the early 80s. And like John says, they were trying to make a documentary about behind the scenes at Sesame Street. And it never happened, which is good for us, I think, that it never yes. happened. But, um, you know, but they, um, everybody was speaking in the film in the voice of that time. So, you know, you know, like you said early on, you know, we, 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 we use terminology differently, you know, and I think that our film reflects what their core beliefs were and, and what they were trying to do. Did the writer's room, were they doing it exactly in the right way? Maybe yes, maybe no, but I think that just having the intentionality of what their goals were, you know, I think that, that does come through in our, in our film. Absolutely. I wanted to ask you about the, the footage, that how you were able to access that never before seen footage. We went to hotfootage.com <laughs> and we just downloaded, I just put a search engine in and it just came never up. It was seen. super or. easy. <laughs> <laughs> or the real story. No, we were, we were really fortunate to have a great relationship with Sesame Workshop um, and the Henson Company to get access to their archival, um, and which you see in the film. And this, the Victor DiNapoli footage, you know, is just a treasure trove of this incredible behind the scenes. And as we've said, it, it's so wonderful because he was part of the gang. So in interviewing these folks, they are just themselves yeah, and open. really open and lovely and, you know, uh, willing to tell him anything. And then we also had an amazing archival producer, Rich Ramsberg, who found just gold. You know, some of the segments that you see, the Mississippi segment, um, there's a piece, um, Seeds of Sesame, it was from the Canadian Broadcasting. Yeah, CBC, yeah. Yeah, CBC. Uh, that hasn't literally been seen in 50 years that we were yeah. able to incorporate into the film. And it was actually really fun for us to show like the workshop some of this footage that they hadn't seen <laughs> or hadn't seen in a very long time. But we, Rich did an amazing job of uncovering that footage that really helped to inform the narrative of what we were trying to show. One of my favorite things is uh, the piece where John Stone talks about watching a TV and he sees a public service announcement, send your kid to the ghetto. And he, he watched that and he said, this is what I'm gonna, this is what the show's gonna look like. It's gonna look like this commercial. And we looked for that it took, PSA yeah. almost a year. We, it, it took us a year, and by the time we found it, from the time that we that Marilyn said, I want this piece of footage, and Rich said, all right, I'll see what I can do. And then we actually finally got everything signed was three years. Wow. For that little tiny snippet that you see in, in the movie of Send Your Kids to the Ghetto. It was documentary not film and easy. not for the impatient. That's right. Yes. <laughs> if you so like to wait, you... <laughs> then documentary filmmaking is for, for you, you, friends. Right. <laughs> so how long did you work on it then? If that was three years, was it? Since months? 1865, <laughs> we've been working on this film since 1865. Since it was an idea yeah. in their head. Well, there was a little pandemic in yeah. the middle yeah. of all this. Um, fortunately, we had gotten done our our shooting, our yeah, principal shooting. Bulk in, of it. By December of 2019, we closed down the main production office, and we were about to go into post-production in the first quarter of 2020, and we all know the, how that went. But <laughs> <laughs> So it was, I think, all Pretty in about six, six years. years. Yeah, wow. from, from start to finish. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. So I have to ask you, you kind of alluded to it earlier, did you grow up watching Sesame Street? I did, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, we, we watched, you know, Grover and I have the same birthday. It's October fourteenth. She's on, 14th. She's on it's Thursday, up. by the way. So anyway, um, send presents. But um, no, I mean, I, I I would watch the show probably longer than most people. I just was so enamored by this amazing place. You know, it was such a. I think it, some of it really sort of shaped who I am as a as a storyteller and as a filmmaker because it was this world that was built. You know, it was this very specific place, and it had its own rules and it had its own characters, and they were all really funny and awesome. And it was a place you wanted to be. I mean, you wanted to live on Sesame Street, and 
Yeah, I mean, that was, I was always watching that show, but you never watched it. Yeah, I'm the anomaly here. I, of course... Made for a good film team. I, <laughs> of course, was aware of Sesame Street, but I, I didn't watch it so much as a child. And um, for me... Do you hate it, the Muppets, Marilyn? The Muppets are part Confess of my blood. <laughs> um, for me, it was so uh, it, unbelievable to just delve in and find out really the, the activism part of it and all of that really tied me to it. But um, I, I don't know. I think for me, it, it, this is a film about Sesame Street, of course, but it's something else. For me, yeah. it's a film about this group of adults that set out to change the world. And that's what I love about it. That's what it means to me. And um, when I made Mad Hot Ballroom, it was a movie about dancing, but it was about, it was something like what Street Gang is about. It was about a group of people that are pursuing something. And I don't know, it, it's helpful to have a, another perspective that runs parallel to yeah. the surface of the story for me. Mm -hmm. um, and so to me, this is a story of a bunch of rebels, mm -hmm. you know, who set out to try something. And it was spectacularly successful, but it could, could have, have been anything. Yeah. 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 Or maybe people wouldn't have found responded. it. Yeah. 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 It's interesting, too. It seems so clear now when you think, OK, you're trying to reach black and brown kids, urban kids educate them so make the street look like something that they would feel familiar with but so many other shows would be like oh let's do you know romper room or let's do something you know like you wouldn't you wouldn't have thought. it's both obvious and brilliant at the same time yeah. yeah and i think that is and and not but and i think the best part about that was it resonated with every child that watched the show yeah. right, right? and so put off the kid right. who was raised in a mansion right. or something right and do, and i think that's another lesson i mean i think there are so many things that this and I agree with, and obviously with Marilyn, I mean, what we want people to take away from this film is that the undercurrent here is be bold, be brave, you know, reach out, like learn, you know, step in. <laughs> and because it's so incredibly important, you can make an impact as an individual. Um, and it's inc important to know that you have that power within yourself. And I think that's what the show taught children. I mean, at watch, growing up watching Sesame Street, it well, I very much viewed it as, giving me a view into a world that I wanted to be a part of. And, and that's what it continues to do, and that's why it continues to resonate you know, with, with families and with children and with audiences. And it's about stepping out, you know, introducing yourself, finding new, finding new things in this world, introducing yourself to the world, and learning. Yeah. And it's what it continues to do, and it's critically important. Because I find it interesting that even when, you know, always there's an amazing, wonderful reaction that happens when, oh, what project are you working on right now? Well, I'm doing a Sesame Street documentary, and they're like, let me tell you about <laughs> Sesame Street in my life, you know, which is everybody this has happened to. But a lot of people that we talk to, it's like, well, I grew up in, you know, on, in a farm town, and I learned what a city was because of Sesame Street. Mm -hmm. You know, and it is that reaching out. It is that, that understanding that there is more out there. And, you know, you can't go to Never Never Land, but you can go to, you know, Harlem if you, you know, to, to see what it's like. Mm -hmm. You know, you can go to the city. You can understand what these different people have, you know. Because difference doesn't need to be a barrier. It can be our connector. Right. I love that. I love the embracing of differences, whether it's a grouch or whether it's just someone who loves cookies or whether it's a person or, you know, when you're learning to count too. I mean, it was yeah. just, there were these things that are just sort of fun. And then there's things that really are meaningful. Um, and, and the way they blend, they're all meaningful, but in different ways like that. Yeah. I love that uh, these um, comedy writers that were really aspiring to do adult entertainment, including Jim Henson, um, right. saw something here that was going to be um, challenging and an unexpected launching pad for something great. Um, it wasn't just people that set out to do kids' TV. Right. They were from a different ilk. Yeah. And that's what I love about that, about this group. Bob McGrath said that one of his favorite quotes from Frank Oz is, we don't perform, 
you know, for kids, we just perform for short people. You know, that was always how he did it. I mean, remember, this is like the original title of The Muppet Show was Sex and Violence and the Muppets. I mean, that's where Jim's head was so much of the time. It was in this really... And you see that from the early commercials. Oh, yeah. I mean, people getting blown up, electrocuted, sawed in half. I mean, but that was hilarious. I mean, everybody in the audience is laughing at those moments because they are consistently funny forever. And that's the kind of humor that was injected into Sesame Street all the time. It's, 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 it is, it, there is a line that somebody has said, and it's not me, that Saturday Night Live was essentially, you know, born to a certain degree of Sesame Street. Mm -hmm. That it was, that. We, we understand modern comedy through Sesame Street because these two amazing people were improv right in front of us all the time. One of the things that has blown me away while researching this film and while studying it and working on it is the fact that this uh, very important socially uh, relevant activism, this uh, very sophisticated um, comedy and satire, all of these things came to us through the lens of a show for four-year-olds. Yeah. It, I mean, that's kind of mind-blowing. Yeah. Get them while they're young. That's the, that's the undercurrent. Get them while they're young. Teach them everything awesome when they're four. And that's It'll why. make a better world, you know? And that's why from the beginning, the, the biggest movie stars, television oh, stars, yeah. sports yes. uh, stars, po politicians were clamoring knocking on the door, uh, we, I want to be on Sesame Street, a show for preschoolers. That's kind of... That's you know, and Jesse great. Jackson says it in the film, it's beautiful children will grow up and, and make the whole world beautiful. Well, isn't that the inspiration that we all should be living by? Yeah. Absolutely. All right, on that note, I think that's the perfect note to end on, and thank you so much for this. Thank, you, thank you, of course. Thank so you. much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all for being here.